Good morning, everyone. My name is Alan. I want to say thank you for finding my channel, Kindred Souls of Brooklyn. Today, folks, we're going to take another walk down memory lane and remember a fantastic place called Beefsteak Charlie's. I know you remember it. It was a great place to go and eat and fill up great prices, great food. So sit back and enjoy. But first, a couple of commercials on Beefsteak Charlie's just to remind you of how cool it really was. Beefsteak Charlie, and you're going to get spoiled with free shrimp. Six juicy steaks cooked up just like you like them. And sweet tennis shrimp flowing endlessly. Absolutely love that commercial. I mean, I feel like going there now. In fact, you know something's a really good restaurant when it makes it into popular culture. Here's a clip from the popular TV show Friends talking about Beefsteak Charlie's. The Beef Steak Charlie's was started back in 1975 when the owners of Steak and Brew realized that their franchise was going downhill. And what they did was they looked back in history and they saw there was a famous restaurateur named Charles Chesser. And his nickname was Beef Steak Charlie. And of course he had a restaurant in New York City and eventually he went out of business. But there was no kind of copyright on that name or on that restaurant. So there was really no connection between Charles Chesser and Beef Steak Charlie's. So what they did was they opened up these string of restaurants across Brooklyn and Queens and Long Island, and they were a huge success for a long time. The Beefsteak Charlie's that we used to always go to was the one on 3121 Ocean Avenue, which was right in Sheepshead Bay on Avenue Y. You guys might remember the Wallbaum Supermarket that was right across the street. I'll throw up a couple pictures up there. Uh, today, that Wallbaum Supermarket is a Russian supermarket, and the actual Beefsteak Charlie's which sat across the street, is actually a medical building right now. So I'll show you a picture of that. I always liked Beefsteak Charlie's because it was very welcoming. You know, they welcomed the kids in there. It was always interesting. You had the commercials to like, kind of spur you on. And when you went into Beefsteak Charlie's, the food was really good. I mean, you went in there, you had that little salad bar, and you could have the steaks. And I, I wasn't a shrimp person myself. Uh, there was unlimited beer, wine, and sangria. Uh, the, the soda was Pepsi, so I wasn't a big fan of Pepsi. I'm a Coca-Cola guy. But the thing I found amazing about Beefsteak Charlie's is, oddly enough, there was a similarity between them and Crazy Eddie. And the weird similarity between the two, which is kind of has nothing to do one from the other except for one thing, is that the guy who did the Beefsteak Charlie commercials, his name was Thomas P. Lacey, and he just actually passed away July 20th, uh, 2020. Now, a lot of people thought that he was the actual Beefsteak Charlie, but he wasn't. Much like in the Crazy Eddie commercials, if you remember, there was a DJ called Jerry Carroll, and he was the guy who did all the commercials. These prices are insane. Uh, the real owner of Crazy Eddie's, and I'll put some pictures up, you can see these, is uh, a guy named Eddie Antar. And just like with Beefsteak Charlie's, everyone thought he was the actual owner, but he wasn't. So this guy, Thomas P. Daly, I'm sorry, this guy, Thomas P. Lacey, had a very distinguished career. I mean, I knew him as Beefsteak Charlie, but more recently he was on a lot of uh, episodes of Law and Order. He was in a lot of different movies. I'll put up his filmography over here. So what the, what the people who own Beefsteak Charlie's actually did was they just went out there and found an actor who was from New York, which uh, Thomas was from New York, and they just you know, gave him the old style haircut with the part in the middle, and he's a chubby guy, looked kind of like a very gregarious type of guy, and they put him in the commercials. and. The customers loved it. The people responded like crazy. Everyone thought that was Beefsteak Charlie, and for the most part, he was Beefsteak Charlie, because that's the guy we were used to. So at its peak, I guess Beefsteak Charlie's pretty much peaked back in 1984, and at its peak, it had over 50 different restaurants. But then as, as the 80s progressed, they started to lose money, and little by little, the chain started closing down. Um, pretty much most of them had closed by 1987. I think there were two of them left up until the early 90s. One of them ended up becoming the Joe Franklin Memorial Restaurant, and the other one in Manhattan became something else. But when these things were open, they were, they were awesome. I mean, I don't know if you guys remember, they had a little competition from another restaurant chain, which kind of was similar to Beef Steak Charlie's, which I liked as well. And that one was called um, Cookie Steak Pub. Cookie Steak Pub uh, lasted pretty much around the same period, but uh, it wasn't as prevalent. But there was a Cookie Steak Pub in Kings Plaza, and that was the one that we went to. And it was pretty much the same thing. 
uh, you went in there. It wasn't as, you know, again, the commercials that Beef State Charlie's put on kind of embodied what the, what the place was. You went in there, it was a friendlier atmosphere. At least that's, you know, what I remember. Whereas you went into Cookies and it was a little more austere, like, you know, they were a little more serious and they had the steak bar and stuff, they had the salad bar, but it, they didn't seem to welcome the kids as, as much as, as Beefsteak did. Beefsteak just seemed like more of like the place to go. It seemed like more of like, maybe like going to Cheers or something like that. It, it just it was a really cool place to go into and eat. And I guess with all the uh, health situations we have going on in the world today, I imagine that if these places were still around, they'd, they'd be really facing some serious challenges with the um, with the serving and all that because, you know, today we have Golden Corral. You still got a few Ponderosas left over. There's still a Sizzler down here on 192 in Florida. But for the most part, most of these places are struggling. So I think if Beefsteak Charlie's was still around, they'd be facing a lot of obstacles just to stay open, like a lot of other places these days. I mean, I, you know, like I said, folks, Beefsteak Charlie's was an institution, I mean, you know, just by them incorporating their slogans into the commercial, you're going to get spoiled. That was a big slogan for Beefsteak Charlie's. That was all over the posters and, you know, you're going to get spoiled. And, and the other one was, I'm going to feed you like there's no tomorrow. Just really cool slogans, which they incorporated very, very well. And they were true because you could eat in there as much as you really wanted to. So one of the things I loved the most about going to Beefsteak Charlie's was that I was always a fussy eater. And it was a great place to go if you weren't sure, like, you know, if you didn't like a lot of foods, it was a great, great place to go where you could just try different kinds of foods. I remember like a lot of the things that I never ate before, we went there and I, I, I would just try them. You know, whether it be things at the salad bar or whether it be like things off the main entry. Um, it was just really cool to go and do that. And I think, you know, that's what I miss about these places today is that being able to go in there and just be able to be introduced to different kinds of, um, even like the way you got the meat. Like I remember like, you know, it's funny how you think of certain things, but I remember going there with my parents originally. And like, I think it was the place where I learned pretty much, you know, whether you want meat rare or well done or extra cooked. I remember I always liked my meat well done. So that was the first place where, I think they call it when they bow it, where they actually cut the meat, the steak in half, and they actually cook it. So it's extra well done, so it's dark all the way through. I thought that was really nice because they did, they did take a lot of extra care with stuff like that there. I remember one of the other things that I really liked, this was kind of like a silly thing, was that it seemed like when you went to the salad bar, I don't know what kind of contraption they had that did this, but they had this contraption where they had the little white dishes. Now, of course, we know from buffets that restaurants always try to make the dishes very small when you're going for the buffet type, because the bigger the dish, the more people like to waste it. But what was really cool about the white dishes was that one, they were always really clean, but two, it was like they were ice cold. So it was great that when you went and you got your salad or whatever, <laughs> you, gra you grabbed that, that plate and it was very cold. And I'm pretty much a ketchup guy, but I think that's probably the first restaurant that I really ever tried steak sauce on my steak. And you know, they also had some nice chickens too. I think they used to have a chicken in there uh, called, it was called like a Malibu chicken. And the Malibu chicken was just like a chicken breast and it was with the cheese on top. So I guess my, my, uh, my dietary interest or whatever increased as a result of uh, Beefsteak Charlie's. It was really great. But I always my, my, remember my father always telling me, my father would oftentimes get annoyed at me going to Beefsteak Charlie's because I would always fall for like all the, not the gimmicks, but like I would fall for the things, I would eat the things that I shouldn't really eat at a buffet that they tell you not to eat. My father would always tell me, you know, you gotta go there and eat the meat. Don't, don't fill up on the bread. Don't eat the mashed potatoes. Don't you know they put that up there to fill you up? But you know, you can't help how you like to eat. I mean, I'm, I'm typically a very Irish eater. I love the meat and potatoes type of thing, but I absolutely love my starches, love the rice and the potatoes and the bread with the butter. It was just awesome. It was absolutely fantastic. But I guess what I'm trying to say in some crazy way is that, you know, Beefsteak Charlie's went out of business because they lost money, but they obviously didn't lose money on me. So if anyone's out there watching who used to work at Beefsteak Charlie's, I think I probably kept you in business for a little while longer because when I went in there, I certainly filled up on the bread and the starches and all that great stuff. And it, uh, I think it kept you guys going a little bit longer. So folks, I want to know from you, what memories do you have of Beefsteak Charlie's? Where did you like to go to eat at Beefsteak Charlie's? Like I said, for us, it was Avenue Y and Ocean Avenue. Uh, also went to a couple of the ones in Manhattan, but I know there was quite a few in Long Island, quite a few in Queens. Where did you guys go? What was uh, some of your favorite memories of, uh, of Beefsteak Charlie's? 
You know, as years passed, they introduced a character named Beefsteak Chuck, which was the nephew of Beefsteak Charlie. And I think the idea was, you know, I think when they started going down in business a little bit, they realized that they needed to bring some more healthy options in. And supposedly, as the story went, you know, in the commercial, was that Beefsteak Chuck actually went to a restaurant school. And unlike Beefsteak Charlie, who was more of like a, a regular nuts and bolts type of guy, Beefsteak Chuck was up on the latest trends and he always brought like the healthier options in. He was in some of the commercials as well. Folks, if you like this video, I'd really appreciate if you guys could subscribe. Uh, we have a, a non-for-profit foundation. It's a suicide prevention foundation. It's called the Waffles Foundation. We lost my son, Matt, uh, not too far from here. I'm on International Drive. And unfortunately, we, we lost him to suicide back in uh, 2019. So we've started a foundation. It's called the Waffles Foundation. Our slogan is saving lives through music one note at a time. We are a legitimate fund of C3. Uh, we should be getting that notification in about two to six weeks. Uh, we have also been recognized officially by the state of Florida as a non-for-profit. You could donate via Venmo, PayPal. You can go on to the website. Our website is www.wafflesfoundation.org. And um, what our goal is to give out musical instruments to kids who can't afford them. We've, also, we've already given out a few uh, pianos. So if you guys have any musical instruments you'd like to donate or money, it would be awesome. Uh, you can look us up where you know like i said everything is transparent with us uh you can look us up on the internet it's the waffles foundation inc and uh i hope everybody's having a great day if you uh, are contemplating that folks please reach out if you go onto our website the number of the national suicide prevention foundation is on our website also uh within a year when you dial 988 on your telephone it's going to go to the national suicide prevention foundation so uh, you'll be able to talk to somebody, uh, hopefully to talk you down from whatever's going on. So folks, I want to thank you for joining me on this video. This is Al signing off, uh, and I'll see you on the next video. Take care now. Bye-bye now.